Yeah, depends. sure, it depends, right? Okay, so um, that lady here, would you want to tell me who's your so favorite superhero? Maybe Batman. Batman? Okay, so uh, if I probably keep asking this question to every individual, uh, we are likely to hear names of lots of superheroes, right? And we kind of subscribe to the notion that so many superheroes can exist, okay? Because their superpowers are special, and some of the superheroes are, are, are very successful in a particular area, and some aren't in some other areas. So the interesting part is, though we subscribe to this notion of polyglotism in the world of superheroes, sometimes it becomes very difficult for us to apply the same concept to a very real uh, concept. The con the, the, a very concrete thing of selecting a programming language sometimes becomes very difficult, right? So with this, I introduce uh, this topic to you. We are going to talk about polyglot uh, programming in the entire context of agile development. <coughs> yeah, imagine like having a Spider-Man in Kansas City or like in the middle of uh, Arkansas or in the middle of like a small village uh, near Bangalore. There are no buildings, so he can't really jump anywhere. Right? <laughs> uh, so, so that's what we are going to talk about. Like there are some tools that are good in certain contexts, and there are some tools that you may want to think of if the context changes. Yep. So I am Shashank. Uh, I've been working with ThoughtWorks for the last two years. And incidentally, I've been doing Agile only for two years. That's 20% of the work experience I have, and I'm loving it. Uh, my name is Pramod Sadalge. I've been working with ThoughtWorks since 99. Uh, and I've been doing Agile since 99. Yep. So let's get started. Uh, before we start the presentation, um, we're going to basically, this is a case study of one of, the, uh, one of the work we did for one of our clients who's working in consumer electronics, especially uh, creating, uh, building <coughs> uh, hardware for gamers, like headsets, mice, and stuff like that. So I'll just do a small demo of the application. And then we'll go into the slides and we'll talk about polygot uh, programming, right? So uh, the application which I'm talking about is this. And the hardware it's, which is, it is going to configure is this headset. Okay. Now the client basically has a lot of devices. There are headsets, as I said. There are uh, mice, which you can see, a rival. Okay. I haven't got it with me. But what I'm going to showcase is <coughs> uh, the ecosystem which we have built to, to basically run a software on my laptop on any OS, which we support, to configure a device. And this also, you can also configure, you, your, your setup can actually back up these configurations to a cloud service. Yeah, the use case for that was like, let's say I have set this machine up, I have taken a lot of effort to set my mice, set my headboard, or uh, headsets, set my keyboard up, and things like that. And I go to my friend's house, or I go to a gaming, uh, championship or something like that where they provide their own hardware, right? Uh, or own computer, right? So at that point, I have to like put out, plug in all of my stuff and set it up again. Instead of that, why can't I just go to that machine and log into my account so that all my settings just appear automatically? Yep. <coughs> so uh, I'll just do a quick demo. Okay, I'll not get into too much detail about this application. So you can perhaps see this orange light on the headset. Uh, I'm just giving you an idea of the, how the UI looks yeah, like. Hold it. You okay. can use both of your hands. And we'll basically talk about what was used to build this UI and what are the processes which are running on this laptop, right? So if I click on Siberia Elite, there is this window which comes up. Okay. It's a pretty uh, awesome UI. As, like, when I look at it, I always like it. Uh, the best part here is the, the easiest thing which I can showcase is changing the LED of this uh, this lamp, and I think because of resolution, uh, yeah, I, I think that is, yeah, yeah, got it. So if I click on this, it will basically, where promote, I think it's a bad day for both of us. Let me change the resolution a bit. I think no, it's, it's this yeah. So hold on, just give me a minute. I'm not sure if it can support it, but I'll just give it a try. All right. Let's start it all over again. So on the dock, there's an icon. OK, so on Mac operating system, there will be a different way to open this engine. On Windows, there will be something different. And if I click on Open Steel Series Engine 3, 
I click on Siberia Elite. I'm pretty sure it's not going to work again, but what the hell? Okay, I'm not going to continue on this anymore. So the idea is when I click on this, uh, this interface, uh, it is very easy for me to configure the device settings. And many of these devices actually have RAM and uh, uh, so they are, the, the firmware can, the, whatever configurations I want to deploy, they get deployed on the device itself. Okay, so let me not get into too much detail, especially since I could not show what I was trying to show. Let me jump back to the presentation and let's talk about what we came here to talk about for. So let's talk about the problem statement. So every, every uh, engagement starts with a problem statement. The client says, uh, to create multi-platform gaming hardware configuration software with crowdsourcing and backup abilities with an awesome GUI, which looks the same on all platforms. Adding a new platform of device should be trivial. Now this is a very easy statement to make, but all of us know how when we do cross-platform, how things become complicated very fast. Of course, don't forget that the software should have minimal CPU and memory footprint because gamers hate bloatware, right? So especially because when you are playing like multiplayer games and stuff like that, if your configuration software itself is taking like 500 MB of RAM and chewing up CPU, they can't play the game, right? So that's why they don't like software that is chewing up RAM or resources on the machine. Yep. <clears throat> and the team is basically a very small team, okay, distributed across three continents. And uh, what he says, obviously, is they should not be busy tackling um, operational challenges. They should be busy delivering features, right? A very typical scenario, but sounds tricky in the beginning, right? So it's not a special situation. Now, in this scenario, when you see the entire problem space well-defined, the question is, how do you architect? So let's look at the world for inspiration, right? Whenever we, are, we have a problem, especially when we're doing object-oriented stuff, we always say, OK, let's look at the real world. Let's see how the real world works and maybe model it back. So let's look at how other professions do their polyglotism, right? So you don't find a carpenter who just has a hammer, right? So you find a carpenter who has many more tools than just a hammer, right? So he has nails, he has other tools, he has saws and things like that. The reason is he wants to tackle the art of, or he wants to tackle the problem of building furniture with all the tools that he could use to build a furniture, right? So similarly, why not try the same approach in software, right? Why not just uh, see and experiment what all other things I can try or what all other tools I can use to make sure that I have the right kind of solution for the customer. And yes, the interesting bit is things in world are there for a reason, right? Now these things are very tangible, so maybe we are able to appreciate the reason why there are so many tools, but in software some things are not very tangible, so the choice becomes a little difficult, right? In fact, if you look at the diagram, the carpenter actually uses too many tools to get the job done, right? Okay. Jumping back to our uh, software world, sometime back, a lot of financial systems were using COBOL to design their systems. If, you, if we ask this question today, would you actually program in COBOL, which is actually in its own place a decent language, the question many of us would say, I don't think so, probably because the languages have evolved over, the, over a period of time. There are other high-level languages which probably tackle your domain problems in a much more efficient fashion. So one thing is set for sure that languages, as many as they are, they are not equal, right? There will be some, in some context, some languages will be far more powerful than the others, and it's not about the subset of features which are there in the language, but how much of a match it is to the problem we have at hand. In fact, uh, to, be, to be honest, the world is actually quite polyglot in nature, and I don't think I have to get in too much detail about this, but this is a fact, right? In fact, polyglot programming is something which we have not been doing right now. It's, it's a pretty old concept, and all of us consciously or subconsciously have been doing it at some point in time or even today, right? But we never really identify it and say, okay, I am actually doing polyglot programming. <coughs> Examples are there, right? We have used bash, shell scripting, for string manipulation, etc. We have used awk, Perl, sed, and the list can obviously keep going on. Formally, I think Neil Ford, coined this term in 2006. This is the link to the first blog post which uh, he had coined, he had written. And soon after that, the JVM was also maturing at its, at a good pace. And we, you would have seen that at that point of time and onwards, a lot of JVM-based languages 
came into existence, right? So you already had Java, then you started having JRuby, you had it Jython, you had Clojure, Scala, Groovy, and so on. And each one of these languages ex came into being for, like some of the languages were pretty older, but some of them came into being because they were serving a particular uh, use case in its, in the, probably not so efficient in the non-JVM world, but probably performance or some other feature got introduced when they started using the entire JVM for running itself, right? And to, if you look at this list, you will see some of the very object-oriented stuff on the top, and then you will see functional programming coming into the picture, right? And you will see now onwards, like Intel, and they made predictions, right, that a chip can only be that much faster. So you'll start having multi-core machines, and you have to start realizing how to write your code so that it runs efficiently on a multi-core system. So multi-core programming is now becoming quite a very important technique everybody should have in their pocket, and hence the rise of functional languages which focus on immutability of data and stuff like that. <coughs> so let's talk of our experiences. Yeah, so this project uh, that we started like maybe early 2013, the client came to us and we had this to deliver all the way from integrating with the device at the device level, uh, talking to device drivers, and all the way to like the UI that we built, uh, multi-platform UI that we built, and the ability for the UI or the client-based software, desktop-based software to talk to a cloud service where they could be uh, saving all of their configurations so that they can download later or share with other people and things like that had to be built in one stack. Like the experience had to have all of that from top to bottom. Yeah. <clears throat> so two things uh, come into play, right? Observation and awareness. Observation that the domain is actually complex enough that you have to actually break it down into smaller components, which can be studied further. And an awareness that, not all lang that some languages will suit a particular context better than others. As long as these two things are playing in anybody's mind, I think the rest of the things become pretty simple. So let's talk a little bit about observation, right? So functionally, we have actually evolved quite a bit in being able to divide the functional space into nice user stories and break the entire functionality down into small consumable units, right? So functional processes are probably more formal. Technically, we've always been doing this, right? We've always been dividing and integrating. We've always, whenever there's a large component to be built, we've always been dividing into smaller components so that they are testable in its own way. And then we have been integrating it in some, some form, one way or the other. <coughs> so, and, uh, so let's talk about, uh, We've talked about the observation, we've talked about, so Eric coined this term, right, domain-driven design, right? So the idea was that you have to divide the entire domain into subdomains, and you have to figure out what is the bounding, what is the bounded context in which your paradigms, paradigms lie, right? So initially you'll see a lot of paradigms appearing whenever you're looking at a problem. You ba we basically have to separate those paradigms in such a way that we know that these are the boundaries in which each one of them lie. So what I've done here is I've taken this problem statement and I've broken it down into some paradigms which I can see up front, and then we'll see what languages, how we match these paradigms to the languages. Right, if you look at it here, the client is looking for multi-platform, that's a paradigm. He's looking for hardware configuration software, that's a paradigm. He's looking for minimal CPU usage, that's a paradigm. He's looking for a small team and distributed way to give this solution, that's a thing that you have to look at. That's a memory footprint, that's a paradigm. So how do you solve all of these with the same language, right? Yeah. So that you have to, when giving a solution or coming up with architecture for this, you have to think about how this can be done in a language. If it cannot be done in a language, what language is suit to fix that particular paradigm or solve that particular paradigm? Yeah. So <clears throat> I've divided this into what best I could do here. Um, so at the cloud side, you have a lot of operational challenges, right? You have got maybe a two, three member team, which is going to manage a lot of virtualized hardware. And the hardware which the company sells is actually sold in a lot of geographical areas around the world. So you've got Japanese gamers, you've got Southeast gamers in Southeast Asia, you've got Europe, you've got Americas. So there are a lot of time zones we are, we are covering. And for it to be performant, you have to actually bring the cloud service nearest to whoever is consuming that data. Which means actually we've actually, so we are using Amazon AWS and we have multi-zone multi setups. And people who are managing it are not 
too many. So we have to be efficient in how do we set up the cloud and scale. Second thing which comes in is this software is used for backing up, and backing up should never fail. So we have looked at a database which is highly available and partition tolerant. And on the API side, we have a lot of APIs which we have built for doing the backups, uh, creating a config, and stuff like that. right? And especially since this is distributed, and at the same time in the cloud, there is a lot of automation that goes into like, pop, uh, like a Chef or Puppet uh, to automate AWS instances. If instances go down, bring them up, and that kind of stuff. So there is one other paradigm that you have to think about infrastructure management, like not just like programming the solution itself, but how do you manage infrastructure in the back? Yep. And on your laptop, there are actually two pieces which are supposed to run. The GUI is actually a short-lived process, right? I mean, it will be consuming some amount of RAM when it is alive, and gamer would not want that to be alive when he's playing a game. So the idea was that the GUI should be running as a separate process. It should be short-lived. Whatever code you, we build, we think we should build with a shared code base across platforms, and not specifically for natively for each platform, because that becomes a maintenance nightmare. And it should look awesome. Uh, I've already talked about looking the same. And then you have the core piece, which is a long-running process, which will probably run as long as the system is not restarted. And it should not, the, so the language which you use should, be, should have a good garbage collection. It should not crash, right? It, it should be easy to write multi-threaded code in it. It should build easy. And obviously, it should interface well with the lower-level drivers, right? Which are more often than not written in C. And the device library is, we built was kind of a little generic in nature, in the sense that it has a generic HID USB interface. And it should be easy for us to add a new device, swap in, swap out a new device configuration into the entire setup. Sometimes it so happens that as the device has been released in the market and the user is already using, you find a bug in this device hardware, device level software, you want to release it. We wanted a mechanism where we could just release that software through the cloud. Like in the cloud, we will put new software for the device. And the UI would pick that up, give it to the core, and the core would then put it on the device so that we would get a fix automatically and not having to go to a, a site where you download a patch and then apply it to the device. Yep. All right. So let's talk about awareness, right? So in our search for a right language, we should always underrate the current skills which we have, right? So many of you must have heard a blub programmer, right? because we don't want to offend a particular uh, person who likes a particular language. Let's say there is a language called blub, right? So anybody who codes in that language, for him, all those languages which don't have that feature set will feel inferior, right? He'll feel that his language is better than most of the languages because there are some feature sets which his language has. Now, when he or she looks up into the power continuum of the language, uh, all the languages available, all the languages which look obscure the psychology is that most probably that language is as powerful as the language which I know, but there are some hairy syntax thrown inside it. So why should I actually even try to learn that tough syntax when I can already do it the entire bit in a language which I'm very good at? But more often than if you now do use some kind of an induction, the person who is using a language which is hairy will look down on that programmer and say that language is actually an inferior language in whatever context we are talking about. So it is very important for us to forget the part where we have an expertise in a language and actually genuinely and honestly figure out how should, which language is the perfect for us, and then let's see how we can go around in dealing with the operational challenges of having a, a multiple languages in our entire solution. And choosing the right language is actually a competitive edge. Uh, as many of you would have noted, WhatsApp got sold to Facebook for a huge, insane amount, right? And from what I've read, they have a very small uh, number of engineers, like around 32 engineers. 32 engineers building software being used for 450 plus million users with 1 million users getting added. Do you think they would have worked if they would have used any arbitrary language or any mainstream language? Obviously not, right? They needed a distributed fault tolerant system and they chose Erlang for it. And there is a reason why Facebook, there is a reason why all the mobile companies use Erlang in the backend systems. And in fact, Ericsson was the one which gave us Erlang, right? So whenever you're building a system which is kind of similar in nature to WhatsApp or building a chat client, chat software or something, you should definitely think about what all languages might 
already might be suitable for you. So here we enter into the case study. Uh, what I've done is I've tried to put these subdomains back and I'll replace these subdomains with a choice of technology there, right? So if it's cloud and I've used Keynote for the first time, so I've been a little fancy with the animation effects. Okay, so I burned the subdomain out and what do I have? So I'm using Chef, I'm using React, and we are using Sinatra. So as uh, Pramod pointed out, it's very difficult to manage a lot of software if, they are, if you have to actually log in into the machines and execute those commands. How pretty it would be if your infrastructure would be nothing but code, right? And many of you might have used Chef. So in Chef, you should go back and read about it if you haven't. Uh, you're dealing with infrastructure service, so scaling becomes very easy, right? And if you're combining it with certain reporting technologies, right, Nagios or whatever, then auto-scaling also becomes, doesn't, become, not, doesn't remain a very difficult problem to deal with. On the database side, we've used uh, React, and uh, it's actually a distributed database with a very tunable cap. So in React, you can actually say uh, how much consistency I want, what is my availability requirement, what's my partition tolerance. So for example, if I am feeding some logs into the database, I don't need it to be very consistent. So I can tune a particular bucket to say I don't need consistency here, but I need more partition tolerance or availability. And on the API side, we have used Sinatra, which is a modular rack app. Uh, there's not too much domain logic there, and wherever there is not too much domain logic, we have tried to use a language which is faster for us to develop. Yeah, and these choices, we don't, didn't just come up with like, okay, let's think, oh, React, oh, Chef, and that kind of stuff. We actually implemented this in multiple different ways. Like, one of the stack was using these. The other stacks, we tried Java with Mongo. We tried Java with React. We also tried Clojure using the Express framework uh, with React as a backend. Uh, so after trying a bunch of these different stacks, that's when we said, okay, this stack looks better for us, like from multiple angles, like productivity, like uh, ease of scalability, and a bunch of other different things. So, so not just that we said, okay, in this scenario, these are the requirements, let's choose this without experimenting. We actually experimented with multiple different languages, even in that one particular domain, to come out with the right uh, technical stack or tech stack that we needed for that. Yeah. All right, GUI goes out in flame, and what do we have? We have, so, so the critical choice here was using Node WebKit, right? We, we're writing native apps in HTML5, and uh, because we're writing it in HTML5, we are using JavaScript, we're using CSS3, and a lot of developers are actually very good in using these technologies, right? So building an awesome UI becomes quite simple. Right? If, I would have, if we would have been developing in some of the native technologies, then there would probably be some time where we would learn how to build an awesome, awesome UI in that native platform. So Node WebKit for us was like a game changer, right? You write once and you run it anywhere. On Node WebKit, yes, you would know, you can actually uh, choose to uh, run any of the Node.js modules and other libraries. We are using Knockout for, our, um, for handling the domain logic better on the UI end. And for whatever special things we have for an OS level, like for example, we have the taskbar, we are using some, we are using Cocoa or we are using .NET or something on the Windows side, so that those small pieces can be written in native, native technologies. And uh, the most critical piece, the core, is actually written using Google Go. So there's a lot of opinionated controversy around Google Go whether it's good or whether it's bad. Um, the reason we like Google Go is because of the less fluff around the way you write code in Google Go, right? There are a lot of things missing in Go. You don't have virtual inheritance. And the moment you say that, a lot of people who do object-oriented code say, it doesn't make sense, right? How can you have a language which works which doesn't have inheritance in it? But it has a very wonderful way to write code in the whole interface fashion, where the way we leverage it is, we have a particular interface, and the implementation of that interface is different for different OS. So the rest of the code is all same, right? Uh, it is all written in the best practices of Go. All those parts which are special to a particular OS, and we support Windows and Mac, and both Windows 32-bit and 64-bit, 
So those implementations now become very small, right? I mean, it's just a small part of the entire code base, which is, has to be written in a different fashion. Um, simple and unambiguous. You focus on the domain. There are a lot of, the, the, the standard library is very rich. So you can easily, you know, you, you don't have to think about how to create the net HTTP connection and do all that low-level stuff. And the other amazing part is the built-in concurrency primitives. So as many of you would have experience this pain, right? Whenever you're writing multi-threaded code, you will always enter into some very subtle bugs which you cannot reproduce easily. And then you have to spend time on figuring out how to synchronize and how to set up the mutexes and stuff like that. In Go, there are primitives which are already available, and it's all about using those primitives in a very simple fashion. So, and it handles all the rest, the rest of the multi-threaded, all the complexities behind it. And we needed something like that. And to interface with other libraries, Google has, uh, Google Go has C Go, C uh, Go Lisp and stuff like that, which helps us to interact with the device library. And uh, yeah. So the Google Go choice was an interesting uh, discovery for us. And none of us actually knew Google Go when we started doing it. Device library, we are using good old C. And we are using Lisp here. Now, the usage of Lisp is actually very limited, OK? Uh, but if you look at Lisp, um, it is code which writes code. And data itself is code. So it's very easy for us to write the device specification in Lisp and load it in Go. So what happens is uh, you can very easily change the way Go sends signals to your device devices. So if you have a new device, just write that specification in your Lisp language. And it just loads it up in Go, because Go cannot reload classes, right? You have to actually kill the Go process and bring it back again to reload everything, whatever is there. In this case, we are just swapping it, swapping out the configuration by using this amazing piece of technology. And obviously, Lisp, I mean, is the most powerful language. I don't know if I should actually be talking too much about it. But anyway, Lisp is the topic of another day. That was a feature which we also used to push down like new versions of device drivers or bug fixes and things like that. So you could push it down that way. And the user didn't have to kill his process. It would just be like an on-the-fly update of the device drivers. Yep. OK, device drivers, like there was not much debate here. Uh, you've already got, we know that C is good at doing those low-level things. And we didn't want to disturb. So the idea is disruption is required, but we don't want to take it too far. And the most interesting piece is this is actually a 10-member team which manages all of it. And as Pramod rightly said, all of this looks very intimidating if you look at it once, like at once when you look at it. But it's all evolved over a period of time. Like it's all evolved over eight or nine months of development. Right. It, it was not like as if the first day we went, OK, we made all these 10 different choices and started like everybody started coding in that scenario at the go. What we started doing was, OK, let's experiment on this a little bit, see how it flows, then let's try the other piece, see how it flows, and slowly start integrating them and bringing up new languages. What this also gave us, the 10-member mem ten team that was there was rotating and doing all of these at the same time. It, there was no silo like this one guy or girl does Golang, this one guy or girl does JavaScript only, this one guy or girl does React only. There was nothing like that. People rotated about and were comfortable going through the uh, pace of stuff. Yep. Yeah, yeah, sure. With the flames. <laughs> yeah, one second. I, I find it very interesting to burn all this up. Yeah, we are going to load the presentation up anyway later, so you should uh, not yeah. have to worry about documenting it. OK, thank you. All right, the secret sauce. There's always a secret sauce, right? So the secret sauce, which we think, is feed the build pipeline. The build pipeline is most crucial, right? Only when you think from the perspective of how your build pipeline should be built, a lot of things become very clear. So this is one of the pipelines which I'm showing here. It may not be very clear, but this is a build pipeline for building the production installer. So there are similar build pipelines for, for development environment, for staging, for production. Okay. Yeah, the decide. moment you bring so many components into play, suddenly you're wondering like how, how, what are the integration problems going to be? What if someone changes code in that particular scenario and breaks? Like let's say someone changes code in the core and the UI is dependent on it and things like that. Like how do you integrate all of this? 
you solve it by using build pipelines, like dependencies between these smaller projects. Uh, if something changes in, like say, core, you compile core. If compile, is, uh, compile and test and all of that stuff in core is successful, then you say, okay, now uh, the UI is dependent on core, so I'm going to trigger a build on the UI side to make sure the UI tests also run, UI integration tests also run, so that it confirms that the core is conforming to whatever it's expecting from. So that's known as a build pipeline. If you yeah. are, if you see Jez around, you should talk to him about build pipelines. Okay, so let's talk about how we set up the build pipeline. <coughs> Simplifying it a little bit, um, you have these main components, right? You have the device library, core, drivers, front end, functional tests. And I'm drawing a boundary here saying that nothing escapes this area unless and until the functional tests have cleared. So let's look at it one by one, right? So drivers are basically all your C code, which we don't test independently as of now. Any change in the driver or firmware which comes from the vendor or even if we make any changes, it's just basically, so all these three things, any change in driver's core or front end will actually trigger the functional tests. I'll come into functional tests in a little while. The device library is the part which is the shared library across all devices. This is the place we put in the list magic and stuff. So any change which happens in the device lib, it actually pushes changes into Git, okay? We're using Git as source control. And it, it pushes it the, uh, so it's some kind of an embedded polyglottism where any code which gets changed in device lib gets pushed into core itself. And any git, any change in core itself will actually trigger a build for core. And what will happen for each, for core and both front end is the executable will be created depending on whatever the platform will decide whether it's Windows 32 and do all the environment variable setting. And a tarball will be created which contains the executable for both core and similarly for front end only if the unit tests pass. So we have unit written unit tests for both, obviously for both core and front end. So only if your unit tests pass for core, a tarball is created and then the functional tests again get triggered. On the front end side, <coughs> uh, since we are using HTML5, HTML is an HTML app ultimately, we are using Jasmine for our unit testing. Okay, and Jasmine, as you would have used, is actually a pretty good tool to test your user interface, right? So only when a Jasmine test pass, Grunt basically does all the hard work, it, it creates the package, and if any of these three things are disturbed, the functional tests run. And we don't, and the functional tests, we have uh, used Cucumber to write the functional tests, which is a nice DSL way of writing your tests, in a way that even business people can actually look at the the functional side of the test, the English of it, and figure out what's happening, okay? So you, these contain the acceptance test. So you can actually give it to a QA or give it to a business person to see if all these scenarios are covered or not. And the functional tests also generate some things like code metrics, like code coverage. We don't, want to, we don't go into details like code complexity and things like that, but some basic reports are generated so that you know what's the health of the code line. And once functional tests are, are run and they are successful, we basically call it promotion of build. And uh, when you promote the build, basically all of these tarballs library package gets pushed into one installer. So we have separate pipelines, separate uh, agents, which do the running of this combination for Windows and Mac operating system. Right, so you get uh, like a uh, installer for Windows 32 environments, Windows XP environment, Windows 7 environment, Windows 8, uh, one for Mac, uh, and Mac, as you know, you can't build on other platforms, so you have to build the Mac on a Mac machine. Mm -hmm. So there's a different agent sitting on a Mac build machine where the Mac package is being built. Right? So you have yeah. to take care of those kinds of environmental things. And a build pipeline okay, will definitely have more than one machine. Yep. In fact, I could have shown you, but the network's doesn't, connection doesn't work very well. Uh, I'll see if I can show some page which I've already opened. So once this is done, the, the artifact is actually uploaded to box.com from where QA is can actually download the software to the laptops and just do the testing. Once the testing is done, we upload it to the production website from where generally the general users can actually download the setup. Okay, so other than the making the software language choices, there are some other things which work in our favor. As I've already talked about, working with an embedded Chromium browser really helped us. Okay. And whenever we had components, we have used the service-oriented architecture and when we are publishing the service, we have actually kept it simple. So we have used a RESTful architecture 
to model the service so that it is predictable for the producer and as well as the consumer. And the specifications have been, like for example, we have the SSE client and you have the cloud, right? Now both systems need not be developed simultaneously, okay? You could actually develop cloud separately. You can develop your client separately. And initially you can just decide, both teams can decide saying that what is the specification of the interface we are following. And then we could use mocks and stubs to actually independently develop each of these uh, components. That also gives you a good way of testing these components in isolation. Like if I change something on my cloud side, I can test the cloud side by just running the interface tests or integration tests that the UI is expecting. So I don't have to actually run the UI and then test the cloud side. I could just run queues on the uh, cloud side only, not have to worry about uh, yeah. running the UI side queues also. And we have used Cucumber throughout. It's not that we have used queues only for cloud testing. We have used, used queues wherever we thought there is a web service to be tested. And in our case, the core is actually running as a web service. So it becomes easy for us to use a simpler language in, by, in comparison to some language which may be difficult to master, like Google Go, right? Uh, keeping a tight control of our test code, test code quality helped. And I don't want to beat it to death, but test-driven development really helps, right? If you're writing honest tests from the beginning, it becomes very easy for anybody to know how well you are structuring the code. And when, when people talk about code quality, don't take a perception that they are talking about production code quality. What we are saying is the test code quality also matters. Like as you go further, you have to refactor your tests to be more simpler, more smaller, more granular. They are testing the right things as your architecture is changing, as you are adding more code and things like that. So that your tests, when something breaks, like there's very, it actually points you to the exact part of the code that is failing and not just like a random test that breaks and you have to like debug again to figure out where the problem is in the code. Yep. And speed and simplicity of building Go meant a tighter turnaround. So many languages which are compiled in nature, it is very important, especially when you're using test-driven development, you have this red-green cycle, right? If that red-green cycle is too long, like you, you write some test, the test fails, and you write code, and then you make the test pass. If the compilation times are huge, then it becomes difficult for the developer who's writing the test to be actually be honest when you're writing tests. So go, the, the power of which we saw was the compilation times were pretty significantly low. And we don't care if the ultimate, like people complain that Go creates a large, uh, after the, the package is pretty large in size. That is not a concern for us. And some other non-functional things which worked is having a Skype channel for communication. Some people use Campfire, Basecamp, Campfire. The idea is always communicate. Like we are, we are in three continents, so we have to keep talking to each other saying what we are doing so that the other team knows what changes we are performing. And it's not, need not be a very formal way. Like we are not documenting it in, like in some kind of a, like a story card or something. It's just communicating, just telling what we are working on. And of course, uh, everything is not hunky-dory. It's not that the, you should, we should be applying this to every project, right? So I'm going to tell you what are the challenges which we face. Paradigms are hard to master. Like suppose if I have to learn functional programming, it's going to take a while before I really understand how to write good functional programming code. Now the expectation is that not everybody in the team will learn the language as fast as everybody, right? There will be one or two people who will master it better. The idea is when you're code pairing and you're doing rotation, then automatically this knowledge gets very easily transferred from one person to the other. Especially if I'm a developer and I don't know why I made a choice of a language, sometimes working with it becomes frustrating enough for me not to really extend it well. Or, you know, if I don't know why the choices were made, if I can't see it in front of me, then it very, becomes very difficult to keep the faith. Then you are not bought into the decision of why the language was chosen, then, then you don't become productive, or in sometimes you even drag the team down because you are not bought into the decision. And de debugging can be tricky. This is uh, like when you are having so many moving parts, like how do you debug Go code? How do you debug cl cloud? What I feel is debugging can be easy if you have broken down into components and you have actually got good integration, good unit tests covering each one of those components. In that case, you very easily know which part is actually failing. And then debugging it just becomes like debugging any other application. And don't succumb to the Highlander fallacy, which means, let's say I'm using Google Go and I think it's great. 
it doesn't mean that I replace my other web service in Go, right? If whatever is not broken, don't break it. So if Sinatra is a good choice for me to use the web service at the cloud end, I don't want to change it to Google Go. And yes, most importantly, always code as if the guy who ends up maintaining your code will be a violent psychopath who knows where you live, okay? Remember, whenever, you, whenever we write, start writing code, we actually say this, that, okay, I don't want to be murdered, okay? And ultimately, what matters is a happy client. A client who can give you a feature and which you can give a quick turnaround is actually giving him a lot of competitive edge, right? So the choice of technology actually becomes very important. And uh, to loop back, always remember superheroes, okay? Now this slide actually shows 600 superheroes and when you look at it, you see that all of them are coexisting, right? They're not fighting with each other. So languages need not be opinion wars, right? You don't have to fight one language against the other. Every language can stand in its own might as long as you know, we understand how they work. So that brings us to the end of uh, the presentation. Yes. Uh, let me just check how much time we have. Okay, we have five. Yeah. So if you have any questions, you could take it up. Or maybe I could just do a quick demo of sure. Go for uh, it. like front end side, how things work, you know. So I'm let's let's hope the resolution works for me. So what I'm gonna showcase right now is on the front end side. Um, we have a node, we are using Node.js Node WebKit, right? And we have written unit tests and we are using Grunt. So the idea is try to script your uh, tool chain as much as you can, right? In such a way that every developer knows, just has to execute that command and it does all the packaging and it gives you the final result, whether whatever code you have checked in works or not. So if I just write Grunt here, you'll actually see that it's doing, a quite, it's doing quite a lot of stuff, especially because we are using CoffeeScript, so it's doing conversion from CoffeeScript to JavaScript and things like that. If I start looking from here, it's basically doing a coffee compilation, and if I scroll down, it's running the, converting the specs also. And finally, you'll see that all the Jasmine specs are being run. These small dots are actually each test. So we have 742 tests which pass in this much time. And you'll also see the code coverage result. Okay. Now, you, as you see, even after talking so much about testing, we still have achieved somewhat okay code coverage. You know, there's still some red marks. But if you plug it into Jenkins and say this job will not succeed if the code coverage is not sufficient, then it just depends what, how you feel about code coverage. Like if you think it's just a wasteful metric, then you may not want to use it. And in the end, you basically create your, we are using less, so it's doing conversion to CSS. And ultimately, creating that executable in the form of a zip file and just keeping it ready, right? So the same job actually gets run on the Jenkins side. So as Pramod had pointed out earlier, your things should not be different in your development environment and your Jenkins environment. Try to keep a match as much as possible. And well, any I questions? Yes, yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Who, who made this decision? Yeah. The team made these decisions. So in the beginning I said like we just don't didn't like just sit and decide okay we'll use this. We actually did a spike on multiple technologies, right? Like even on the front end we said okay we can use this, we can try that. Google Go also we tried it a little bit, see how it works with the device driver, see if we can inject Lisp. The Lisp requirement came a little bit later and then we tried to program and see how that happens. On the cloud side I said like we did try Java with React, we did try other stuff to go and over a period of time okay said we, this, this stack works better for us in terms of productivity, in terms of performance, in terms, like there are other trade-offs, right? Like I was telling someone during, during one of the catch-ups outside in the hallway that software development is all about trade-offs and you have to trade one thing against other constantly. So uh, like the cloud side, we picked up Ruby on Rack and then we started going because we thought like Ruby on Sinatra, so that we thought 
we could go faster in terms of development because there is not much domain logic there. Right? So things like that we decided based on uh, actually doing, doing a spike and then okay this works, like, let's choose it kind of stuff. Yeah and it sometimes, sorry. Clash. I mean decisions were mostly about architecture like so we did do some refactoring later on but it was mostly about how the code is structured, where does the code need to lie, what kind of test you need to pick up and that kind of stuff. Because if you are behaving, if you trust your rest of the team members and the rest of the team members show you what they tried, right, there is high amount of trust. If someone just comes in your room and says you will use Golang and walks out, then there is no trust. Yeah. But if you sit in the room, code with them, show them and that's how trust builds, right. If you do that, then there is lot less argument, there is lot less two camps fighting with each other. People kind of tend to pick up like, okay, that makes sense for that solution, that makes sense. I don't know that, can you teach me that? That happens regularly. Right? Yeah, and you need to build trust before you actually make decisions. And that's how trust is built, like by doing it with people and not having this hierarchy like, oh, I am architect, I get to decide. Like there was nothing like that. Yeah, to be, to be honest, if anybody behaves like that, then it's, it's tough. Yes. But to be frank, in our, in our, uh, now the, our client was actually thrives in the gaming industry, right? So he's techni technically inclined. So whenever you're having a discussion, actually, you can actually show him, like, I've built this thing, have a look at it, and then make a choice. So there is an, the, for us, what worked was there was an open mind. So it was easy for us to convince, right? Yeah, Dave. Yeah, actually, if, if I look into the Git account of Steel Series, mm -hmm. then you you'll probably find more than 20 GitHub like accounts to like GitHub repositories, right? But each one of them does not execute independently. Like there are some like, there are some libraries for keeping the firmware. There are some for keeping the drivers. There are some for Go. <clears throat> but essentially, what happens in the end is there is one component which has a release, right? Like for instance, cloud has a release. Now in cloud we may be using four or five technologies, but ultimately all of them are coming together as one installation or uh, one upgrade, right? And especially about software upgradation problems, since we have a good uh, test infrastructure, okay, which also includes performing performance testing, right? So every time anything changes, we run it through the entire test suite, which gives us a very good signal whether something's breaking or not. And though there are so, so many, I have not really realized it. Like, you, you told me that there are 20 and now when I think, I say, yeah, there are so many of them. But when I'm working with them, it's actually four or five main pieces which I have to basically worry about integration. In that particular component. And we have had this open philosophy of as a new release comes, take it and put it through its spaces because we also build performance testing suites on the side and it runs as part of the pipeline, right? So we have this confidence like if, we, if I take it and then if it pulls it and something breaks, then I, I just change my chef stuff to point to a older version and go. Right? So that also gives, like when you automate infrastructure also, it gives you this easy ability to roll back versions. I didn't have to like, let's say React came up with a new version, while we were developing, we picked it up and we went through spaces. If it had failed, we would have just in Chef changed what React version to pick instead of the latest. Right? So that helps a lot in terms of, like even I have seen like we had a three node cluster to begin with, and sometimes we used to take down one cluster and just upgrade one cluster and go in a rolling fashion that way so that you could then pick up and see what happens. Yep. 
So we were working like we were working on cloud, we were working on building core, front end. So the only challenge was the learning curve involved in learning the language. So what would happen is typically in a team there will be one person who will pick it up well. It could be anybody, right? And when you're pairing and sitting with the person, you're actually engaging in a conversation. And in that mode, slowly over a period of time, it, the knowledge level automatically gets upgraded. Yeah, yeah, we also had a lot of lunch and learn kind mm -hmm. of sessions happening during and exploring like Lisp was so new for so many people like then people used to some, some person would take it up and like do a lunch and learn session constantly. And I remember like as long as I was on that project like every Thursday used to be a lunch and learn by, by default, right? Yeah. So you didn't actually plan for it that. And yeah, I mean to be honest, if you look at it like if learning a new language is not that hard. I mean we will never know everything about the language. But we, to know as much, to know that we are doing the right thing, for many people to be doing the right thing and having a conversation, it doesn't take too long. Sometimes I feel we are, we, we are a bit, little bit too conservative about learning a new language, thinking that it has a lot of cost involved. But on the longer run, I think it's better to have an open mind. Yeah, refactoring is actually continuous. We have, we have not right. measured how much of it. Uh, but the only thing is, once if you have a good test suite, you become more confident in refactoring. Can you can we take the questions offline yeah. because I think we'll run into other speakers' time here. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much.